I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is a Palmahawk Media production covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. Urban legends. And strange places. Yes, yes. And please be sure to check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, merch store, and links to our social medias. We also have a little virtual tip jar there, so if you want to leave us a tip, we'll give you a shout out on the show. And this episode is being created in conjunction with our new nonprofit organization, the Florida Themis Project. The Florida Themis Project is highlighting and creating an awareness campaign for Jennifer Odom this month. If you'd like to help support the Florida Themis Project, please check out our website at floridathemisproject.org. The link will be in the show notes. And we are also on all the social medias. All the social medias. Well, like I said, this month, the Florida Themis Project is featuring Jennifer Odom. So in St. Joseph, Florida, at around 3 p.m. on the afternoon of February 19th, 1993, 12-year-old Jennifer Odom got off her school bus, which was around 200 yards from her home, and vanished. St. Joseph is a small community near Dade City, Florida in Pasco County, the rural neighborhood where Jennifer and her mom Renee, stepfather Clark, and little sister Jessica lived was dotted with orange groves. The 15-acre family property was also occupied by extended family. It was a playground for Jennifer and Jessica. Together, they built forts, rode four-wheelers, and spent summer days swimming in the creek behind the house. Jennifer was an honor roll student who played the clarinet at Thomas E. Waitman Middle School. Three days before she disappeared, Jennifer marched with the middle school band, playing the clarinet. She was a barefoot water skier also, once rated the seventh best in the country for her age. Wow. Again and again, Jennifer placed in tournaments. Often, she was the skier who climbed to the top of the human pyramid, gliding atop the water. On the day of her disappearance, Jennifer was looking forward to going to the Pasco County Fair that evening, but she was more excited about her plans the following day. She played clarinet in her school's band, and they were scheduled to compete in the Florida Bandmasters competition in Tampa on Saturday. That's huge, leaving town on a school event. Yeah. She was supposed to have her best friend Michelle over to practice clarinet together that afternoon, but Michelle had to go home first, so Jennifer got off the bus waved goodbye to Michelle, and began the short walk to her home. Jennifer was the only student who got off at her bus stop, located at the intersection of Jessamine and Jim Daney Roads. When Jennifer's nine-year-old sister Jessica arrived home that afternoon around 4 p.m., the door to the home was locked, and she wasn't able to enter. She couldn't get in, and Jessica thought her older sister was just being mean, keeping the door locked and not letting her into the house. So she walked over to the grandmother's house, which this house was on the same property and called their mother, Renee, Converse. Jessica borrowed a spare key from her grandmother and went back to the house. After she unlocked the door and walked inside, that's when she realized that Jennifer wasn't even home at all. Now, she ran back to the grandmother's house to call her mother again and basically tell her, hey, Jennifer's not here. Now, worried, Renee called over to Michelle's house to see if Jennifer had gone there after school, but she hadn't. Now, right then, I knew I knew it was bad, Renee told the Tampa Bay Times, choking on her words, and it was bad. Renee called the police, obviously, right away. Because of Jennifer's age and the fact that she had never even talked about running away before, she always called her mother and let her know where she would be. Police took her disappearance seriously right away. Renee noted that she had told both Jessica and Jennifer that if they were ever approached by a stranger— They should immediately drop all their belongings and run for the house. The fact that none of Jennifer's things were found made them wonder if she had known her abductor and hadn't felt threatened by them until it was too late. Within hours of receiving the missing persons report, more than a dozen deputies and several search dogs started combing through the area surrounding Jennifer's bus stop. A helicopter made repeated passes over the area, hoping to find something that the ground searchers had missed. The search came up empty. Well, it was hard to determine whether Jennifer would have dropped her clarinet or not, being that there was such a huge event the next day. So to me, I I can kind of go either way on that. So you can look at it one way or another. 
Well, a search party was formed immediately after, consisting of family, friends, neighbors, and several volunteers to try to locate Jennifer. Now, some of Jennifer's friends and family members went to the Pasco County Fair in Dade City, where Jennifer had been looking forward to going that evening. Remember we talked about that earlier? Yeah. Now, they went there to pass out missing person flyers with photos of Jennifer and a description of the belongings she had when she vanished. Basically, her backpack, her clarinet, all the stuff. The clothing she was wearing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, by the end of the night, there was at least one flyer posted on every single booth at the fair. And I believe that there were several that were handed to the individuals that were there. So they did right. everything they could at this point to try to locate Jennifer, figuring that maybe she had gone to the fair without anyone else's knowledge. By Saturday morning, the search for Jennifer had become massive. A command center was set up by Jennifer's bus stop, and officials gathered there to map out where they should look next. A detailed account of what Jennifer was wearing and carrying was sent out to the public. She had her teal Jansport backpack, a tan and brown purse, and a clarinet case with her cousin's initials, L.O., on the case. Jennifer was wearing a white zip-up hoodie with the restaurant name Hooters written in orange down the arm, a white turtleneck, a cashmere and angora red pullover sweater, white jeans, and black lace-up boots. Her classmates were interviewed. Everyone remembered Jennifer waving goodbye to the bus with her backpack and clarinet case. Some of the other students remembered seeing a faded blue pickup truck. According to the children on the bus, it was going at a crawling speed when it drove by, but no one saw it stop or Jennifer being abducted. The driver was described by the children on the bus as a white male in his 40s with shoulder-length brown hair. With little solid evidence to go on, investigators concentrated on tracking down this blue pickup truck that had been seen at the bus stop. By Saturday night, they had stopped hundreds of trucks, but were unable to link any of them to Jennifer. Law enforcement utilized every resource available, including trained search and rescue canines, with the hope that she would be located quickly. A total of 60-plus miles were covered during the search effort. Jennifer's mother, Renee, waited at home, just in case Jennifer came back. That had to be an awful situation to just sit and wait and I not know. be able to be part of that. Well, the following day, this being Sunday, February 21st, the search had been expanded into Hernando County. Now, deputies, civilian volunteers, local firefighters, and members of the Civil Air Patrol spent hours scouring the rural area for anything that might be related to this case. Also used were horseback riders and helicopters, which went over areas unsearchable on foot. And some searchers used ATVs so they could obviously cover more ground than you could just walking. Now, residents who were unable to assist in their physical search helped the American Red Cross by donating food to them for the search and anything they could help to assist these people while they were involved in the search party. Now, despite the massive amount of manpower, they found no evidence of Jennifer. So basically, she just vanished. On Monday, February 22nd, the FBI joined the search efforts. Jennifer's family held a press conference on Wednesday – They spoke directly to her abductor, crying as they attempted to reason with him and pleaded for him to return the 12-year-old. In tears, Jessica said, I just want Jenny home. The search continued until Thursday, February 25, 1993, when a man and a woman searching an abandoned orange grove in southeast Hernando County, Florida, found Jennifer on a horse trail. She had been murdered. Due to the state of her body, which had been out in the Florida elements for almost a week, they needed dental records to make a positive identification. But before that confirmation, investigators showed her mother, Renee, pictures of several items of jewelry that were found with the body, which Renee identified as belonging to her daughter. Her clothing was missing, as was her backpack, jacket, and clarinet case. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma to the head. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the medical examiner was unable to say if Jennifer had been sexually assaulted, but the fact that she had been found without clothes on suggested the crime could have been sexually motivated. Which just makes this case even more horrible. Well, Lauren, the horse trail where Jennifer was found, which cut through orange groves and a heavily wooded area, 
most likely would not have been known to someone outside the area. Now, this indicated to investigators that Jennifer's killer probably lived in either Pasco or Hernando County. Now, this was not an area that a random visitor would have known or highly unlikely that they would have just stumbled upon this spot while looking for a place to leave Jennifer. Right. Now, one can only imagine how terrified the residents had to have been believing that there was a child killer living among them. And obviously, they were praying that law enforcement would make a quick arrest. But sadly, there was no arrest. Yes. Unfortunately, the case appears to almost immediately go cold. During my research, I can find no information, persons of interest, press conferences, etc. for the following year. That is like just a fast cold case. The only thing we know is that police believe the person who abducted and murdered Jennifer must have been a local, like Ken just said, due to the fact that he was able to get away so quickly and also because of the location of the body. Now this, when we talk about this, I just, Delphi comes to mind. The Delphi case, yes. the Delphi murders, because they uh, they just kept saying over and over that where Abby and Libby were found in Delphi, Indiana, it had to have been a local who knew that area and knew, you know, where to place them or where to take them. And it turns out it was a very yeah. local person. Well, allegedly. Allegedly, yes. He's not been convicted. Yeah, exactly. So remember, I mean, when you're in an orange grove, these things are massive. Yeah. And if you go forward 10 feet, make a left 10 feet, go up 10 feet, you're you, lost. You could be lost. You're gone. Yeah. It's like a cornfield. It's like a corn maze. Exactly. Really. So let's take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back. And we're back. Welcome back. 16 months after Jennifer's death, Nancy Meyer, a well-known psychic, was brought in to work with the local detectives. According to her website, nancymeyer-psychicdetective.com, Nancy Meyer is one of the top psychic detectives in the world. You've seen her on Unsolved Mysteries, Psychic Detective, Psychic Investigators in the U.S., and the FBI psychic on TV in Japan, where she was nicknamed Madame Montage for her ability to sit down with an artist and draw the faces of perpetrators. Nancy is down to earth and to the point. She is a published author and a retired college professor. According to the website unsolved.com, which is the website for the beloved show Unsolved Mysteries. Love it. The crime scene photographs in the case were classified, so Nancy was not allowed to see them. But with the photographs turned face down on the table, Nancy was able to visualize not one, but two killers in detail. I want to say almost wiry looking in the arms. His arms are not like powerful in the sense of muscle building, but powerful in the sense of someone who works and lifts and has lifted heavy things. So someone that basically does some sort of physical work for a living, not somebody behind a desk, most right, likely. Yeah. Now, the next day, Nancy visited the scene of the abduction. This is Jennifer's school bus stop. Now, Nancy pointed out where the killers had stopped and told how they asked young Jennifer for directions, which this is what detectives were already thinking anyway. Now, the detectives listened, but they never commented. And Nancy said, it's like being in a movie in my head, and I stand beside the victim, and I try to describe everything that I'm seeing as it unfolds. And a lot of times, that's really helpful to the police officers because sometimes they have odd pieces of evidence at the scene, but they don't understand the significance of, and when I describe these sequence of events, it sometimes makes sense out of odd little pieces that they couldn't make any sense out of before. Now, the spot where Jennifer's body was found is marked by flowers and a cross. And Nancy asked if they had found some small metal jewelry belonging to the girl in an area nearby. Now, according to homicide detective Carlos Douglas of the Hernando County Sheriff's Office, they actually had. She was extremely accurate on some things that led us to look in other areas that we hadn't thought of. So we obtained a lot of information from what she had to offer. Now, Nancy also talked about seeing a carrying case with letters on it which very well could have been Jennifer's clarinet case. Remember, it had her cousin's initials on it, L.O. Right, yeah. Now, Nancy also told detectives that she believes Jennifer was abducted and murdered by two men. 
Now, one of which she described as being 6'1 with a medium build and wiry looking arms, stating that he wasn't necessarily strong, but that he used to work out with lifting heavy things. Now, she believes both men to be mechanics and one has a smoker's cough. Now, as we have mentioned before when discussing psychics, we believe there is some validity to them as an investigative tool. Now, I personally lean on the idea that some people can tune into certain energy, and I've discussed this before on the show, and this actual information can be helpful to investigators. Now, they can maybe open a path that was not traveled on by detectives, and it could also send them in a different direction that was previously never considered. Yeah. So basically, it's have like having an extra detective on the case. Yeah, sometimes. Well, Jennifer's story aired on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries on December 2nd, 1994, and generated a lot of leads and publicity, but nothing that helped capture her killer. In January of 1995, a couple looking for scrap metal in Hernando County found a book bag and a clarinet case in a rural area. Both matched the description of the items that Jennifer had been carrying at the time of her disappearance. Then the couple opened the bag and saw a textbook with Jennifer's name inside. Police would later confirm the items were Jennifer's when fingerprints found on things within the bag matched those of Jennifer. They were found 30 miles from her home and about 18 miles from where her body had been located almost two years earlier. The area where these items were found was very rural and remote, not the type of place someone would just stumble upon. Same thing with the disposal of Jennifer, unfortunately. This further solidified the theory that the perpetrator was local or very familiar with the area. As of today, Jennifer's clothing has not been located. Well, let's go ahead and talk about what was investigated as far as suspects. So, because there were a few main suspects in this case. Now, first, there was a man named Frank T. Potts. Now, Potts was a migrant worker and a suspected killer. Now, authorities believe he may be responsible for at least 15 deaths in six states. Yes, you heard that correct. 15 deaths, six states. He went from town to town, wherever the work was, mainly in the southeast, the Carolinas, Alabama, Georgia, and obviously Florida. In 1982, he was sent to prison in Florida for molesting an 11-year-old girl in Polk County. Now, he was sentenced to 15 years but only served six of those years and was released in 1988. Now, once released, he bought 40 acres and built a survivalist cabin on Garrett Mountain in Alabama. A man named Robert Earl Johns of Indianapolis disappeared on April 1st of 1989. His body was found March 11th buried behind Frank Potts' secluded mountaintop cabin after a tip from police in Florida, where Potts was being held in a sexual battery case involving an 11-year-old girl. Now, he was arrested again for sexual battery against a 10-year-old girl in Lakeland, Florida, in 1983, a crime in which he was convicted and served wife in prison. Now, although they cannot directly connect Potts to Jennifer's murder, authorities do know he spent time in Pasco County around the same time she was abducted. Now, one thing to note here is when we started looking into this case and did research in this case last year, I actually sent an email to the prison to discuss this case with Frank Potts, only because I think out of all of the suspects we're going to discuss, this would be the one that I would put at the top of my list. Right. And sadly, less than a month ago, Frank Potts died in prison in June 14th of this year. So his prison sentence is over because he dead. Oh wow! I didn't re- I didn't know he had just died. Yeah, he was he was serving his life sentence, but he was everything. If you look into Frank Potts, he was a horrible individual. Yeah. So that, like I said, I put him at the top of my list as far as suspects. There's a few others that really are kind of close um, and up there, but he was the one that I said was probably most likely the uh, abductor of Jennifer. Well, next we have Mark Evenitz. Richard Mark Edward Evenitz was an American serial killer, kidnapper, and rapist. In January of 1987, Evenitz exposed himself and masturbated in front of a 15-year-old girl in Orange Park, Florida. He was arrested a month later when his ship returned to port. He was in the Navy at the time. He entered a plea of no contest and was sentenced to three years probation. 
He was stationed at Mayport Naval Station near Jacksonville, about 180 miles north of Hernando County. At the time he was caught for the masturbating incident, he admitted to police that when he felt the urge, he would drive around and look for young, short girls with long hair. He was also responsible for the deaths of three teenage girls in the mid-90s in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, and the abduction and rape of a 15-year-old girl in Richland County, South Carolina. Even it has been suspected in other murders and confessed a number of crimes to his sister shortly before committing suicide in Sarasota, Florida. On June 24, 2002, even it's abducted 15-year-old Kara Robertson Chamberlain from a friend's yard in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, you probably have heard her name before because she was the one who escaped from this serial killer. But he took her to his apartment, raped her, and tied her to his bed. While he slept that night, Robinson was able to free herself, escape, and was able to identify her attacker to police. Even it's fled after finding her gone and was tracked by the police to Sarasota, Florida. As they surrounded him, he killed himself. Side note, like I just mentioned, Kara Robinson Chamberlain now uses her experience as well as years of work in law enforcement to speak to groups around the country. She tells her story, helps educate those who work with victims, and empowers individuals to be the best versions of themselves that they can be, regardless of their past. She is very active on social media. But again, there's no concrete evidence to link even it's to Jennifer Odom's murder, but he remains a person of interest. Let's take one more quick break. Okay, and we're back. So let's talk about another suspect, Walter Ducharme. Now, his ex-wife, Kimberly Ann Ducharme, claimed he was responsible for Jennifer's murder. However, she presented inconsistent testimony that didn't hold up when presented in front of a grand jury. Therefore, he was never indicted. Now, oddly... Ducharme did live in Pasco County at the time Jennifer was abducted and killed, but then moved to Maine. This being a huge might-be-guilty flag, as I couldn't find any previous connections to Ducharme in Maine. Wow. So, you're going to go from one end of the continent to the other? I mean, as far south to as far north as you can get? Bit suspicious. Now, a woman named Carolyn Koskoski, who ran Katie's Country Corner in St. Joseph, told police she remembered seeing a man in a blue truck staring at children in the orange groves around the time that Jennifer had disappeared. Now, according to Koskoski, the man in the truck looked distinctly like the picture of Ducharme she had seen on the television. But did he own, rent, or borrow a blue truck at the time? We're not sure. Now, Walter Ducharme was a creepy pedophile who was arrested in Maine in 1996, that's where he went to, for exposing himself to a 16-year-old girl. Now, he served 20 days in jail and had to pay a $670 fine. This is a very small penalty, but, you know, like most people said, it seemed to be a slap on the wrist. But we do know that the justice system was and currently still is flawed, but... You know, there's always strides being made to ensure the punishment is more harsh for crimes involving children and sexual acts like this. Now, police also questioned a man named Earl Bonney, who lived in Hudson, Florida. Now, Bonney was another ex-husband of Kimberly Ducharme. He was polygraphed and questioned, but nothing ever came of this interrogation. Now, Kimberly Ducharme was later arrested and convicted of aggravated child abuse, which begs the question. Is it possible that she may have known about Walter's involvement because she was with him, helping him with the abduction? Maybe Nancy wasn't far off on her vision of two abductors. I assume that investigators looked deep into Kimberly Ducharme at the time, and since no arrests were made, there probably wasn't enough solid evidence pointing to either one of them, because I'm sure that they probably looked into Kimberly as well as they did. Yeah. Well, in 2017, we're fast-forwarding here. Detectives announced a new suspect in the murder of Jennifer Odom, Jeffrey Norman Crum Sr. It all started when investigators got a DNA hit on a similar case. On January 16, 1992, in Pasco County, an unnamed 17-year-old girl was attacked and raped in an area very close to where Jennifer's body was found. 
Detectives believe the 17-year-old victim got off the school bus at US-41 and Twin Oaks Drive and made her way along a dirt road when she was grabbed by the suspect. She was found a few hours later. A brutal blow to her head left her unconscious and near death. Her attacker struck her on the head multiple times with a weapon, leaving behind severe cuts and skull fractures. She survived but was in a coma and underwent two surgeries on what remained of her brain. When she awoke, her left side was paralyzed and she could not form full sentences. DNA was taken from the scene. Years later, a man was convicted of armed robbery and sent to prison, which entered his DNA into CODIS. That man was Jeffrey Norman Crumb Sr.'s son, Jeffrey Norman Crumb Jr. But his son couldn't have been responsible for the attack on the 17-year-old girl as he was only 10 or 11 at the time. So detectives took voluntary DNA samples from other relatives and it led them to Crumb Sr., who had been previously convicted of sexual assault and kidnapping in 1987. It's the first case in Florida where familial DNA has helped make the case. Now, Jennifer Odom was attacked and killed a little more than a year after the 17-year-old. The similarities between the modus operandi in the two cases are what caught authorities' interest. Crom is no stranger to investigators when it comes to rape and assault. Just like we mentioned, he was convicted of sexual assault and kidnapping back in 1987, and he actually served time in prison for that. And he was convicted of the rape of the 17-year-old girl and sentenced to prison. Hernando County Detective George Lloydgren now heads up the cold case unit investigating Jennifer's murder. I believe that there's probably one person, if not more, that would know who is responsible for this, he told Fox 13 News. Loigren also believes that the person could be a family member or ex-spouse or even protecting the killer or just too afraid to come forward. I think DNA is going to be a big part of Jennifer's case as it is with many of the old cold cases. Because items were collected, it's just now the technology has advanced, Loigren added. That gives Loigren a new resolve and Jennifer's family new hopes that her killer will be eventually caught. Now, I would love to know if this quote, DNA he speaks of has been submitted to labs or organizations that can insist in identifying Jennifer's killer or killers. Well, you know, there's a lot of hangups when it comes to stuff like that. And that's something that Ken and I are actually trying to help with. That's one of the reasons we started the Florida Themis Project. Our goal is to eventually be able to help fund these kind of advanced DNA testings. You know, a lot of these counties, they they don't have the resources, they don't have the money to 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 send DNA from some of these really old cases out and pay for the testing and that's something that we are trying to do with the Florida Themis project. Just to give you guys an idea, we're we're featuring Jennifer Odom this month and Hopefully, maybe someday we can help get her case solved. Yeah, and it's not necessarily that the counties or these little small municipalities can't afford it. They may not have it in their budget to work with the cold cases because they're working so many new cases. Right. Because obviously, if you have a fresh new case out there and it hits the desk, that's where the monies are going to be invested because they're trying to catch the killer in the now. Yeah. So looking back, and that's one of the things that you know, Lauren – has talked about before. Um, she's mentioned to me, we've had off mic discussions that yes, when DNA is available, you know, we want to make sure that we can, we as individuals always want to see this information sent out there and, you know, to a lab or somebody that can put the pieces together. We, we've seen what the Golden State Killer. Yeah. I mean, that, that case goes back forever. This guy's got what, four monikers? Five? Yeah. I mean, this guy was freaking horrible, but you know, with enough people coming together, we can make this happen. So I think it's important that we, you know, we go after these cold cases, especially here in Florida. And that's where the Themis Project, I think, is going to rock eventually. Obviously, we're very small. So we're trying to do small steps. But once we get to that point, you know, I think if we get labs involved, if we can, you know, maybe get a lab on our side that will help because, you know, Themis is a nonprofit organization. Right. They might be more apt to help for a lesser charge or something. So 
we're still building, trying to figure out how to get these cases handled, but definitely we're hoping to eventually someday bring some closure to a lot of families, including with this case, the Jennifer Odom family. If you have any information in the case of Jennifer Odom that may possibly lead investigators to an arrest, please reach out to the Hernando County Sheriff's Department at area code 352-797-3714. Somebody knows something. So let's get that information to the right people. I think that's going to be it for tonight, right, Lauren? Yes. And please check out our website to links to all of our social media, Patreon, merch store, and more. And to learn more about the Florida Themis Project or give us a donation, please visit floridathemisproject.org. Make sure to subscribe to our show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. Well, thank you everyone for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.